Hello and good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on a very typical London wet day. Um, a very special welcome to our event partners and speakers for this session. We have uh, Steve from Emborder, um, Prabs from Dunhumby and Flo from CloudNC. Um, so welcome and thank you very much for joining us on this webinar today. Um, my name is Natasha Priya Cannon. I'll be introducing and posing the questions at the end of the, uh, the session as well. I'm the Managing Director for In-House Recruitment, one of the fastest growing communities for in-house recruitment and talent acquisition professionals like you guys with us today. So today's webinar is in partnership with Emborder. Um, for those of you who don't know um, these guys, um, they are an employee onboarding platform and they're used to create an engaging onboarding experience um, for everyone within that hiring cycle. So the title of today's webinar is The Art of Designing an Experience-Driven Onboarding Process, which I'm sure is a, um, a challenge for um, a number of you that we have online and, uh, and further afield as well. I'm really looking forward to this webinar. We had a breakfast uh, with Emborder just a few weeks ago and there were some great discussions, uh, great questions and great insight as well. So from that, um, I will be handing over to, to Steve and the guys um, very shortly. But if you do have any questions throughout the, uh, the webinar, on the right hand side of your screen, you'll be able to see that you're able to ask and pose questions, which we will do at the end of the presentation. There are also some polls that we've got running, um, so it'd be good to understand a little bit more about um, some of your personal onboarding experiences, challenges, and everything else as well. So um, as and when throughout the process um, and throughout the presentation, please do feel free to, uh, to do that. Um, we will be coming to the, uh, the questions at the end. Um, we are recording this session as well, so the replay will be available afterwards and we'll get that emailed out to you. Um, but enjoy this session. I know I'm looking forward to it and I'll, um, I'll hand over to Steve to get us underway. So over to you guys. Thank you very much, Natasha. That's great. Um, and yep, hi there, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this webinar. So my name is Steve Atkinson and I've got the pleasure of being your moderator for today. Um, I work out in Border, so I'm the head of growth here in EMEA. And today I'm joined by our two star speakers. And that's Prabhs Kishore, who is a, re a regional learning specialist at an organization called Dunhumby. Um, and Flo Chapel, who is people partner um, at a smaller but super interesting organization called Cloud NC. Um, so they'll have a, a chance shortly to introduce themselves and, and, and give you a real insight into, into what they're doing at their respective organizations. Okay, so here's what we're going to be covering today. This is the agenda. Um, thankfully for everyone, I'm only playing quite a small part in today's proceedings, um, but we'll be kicking things off by outlining exactly what it is that we mean when we talk about experience-driven onboarding. Um, next, Prabs and Flo will talk through some, um, or will spend some time, sorry, talking through their own experiences and the processes that they've now established at their respective organizations before sharing a really, you know, super interesting set of do's and don'ts, um, lessons and best practices that they've learned and that they're happy sharing today with you. Um, as Natasha said, we'll, we'll finish with an audience Q&A. Um, and as part of that Q&A, um, you'll have the chance to ask questions over on the right-hand side of your screens. All right, so, Part of what we'll discuss is really around you know, how to get buy-in from senior leaders, championing your hiring man managers for maximum impact. We'll share some really fascinating insights into the correlation between um, employee engagement, onboarding, and things like retention and productivity, um, plus much, much more. But we'll, we'll start by talking, or by, I guess, really discussing you know, what do we mean when we talk about experience-driven onboarding? And, and to do that, we'll start by, by um, I guess, defining traditional onboarding. So let's be honest, traditional onboarding is, is, is pretty much broken. Um, I think it, it typically focuses on things like form completion, compliance, task management. All of that stuff is super important, but on its own doesn't really do enough to make a new hire feel valued or welcomed or accepted within an organization. Um, in short, it tends to be built for things like company compliance, not people. Um, and certainly with, with tougher competition day by day for talent, um, and employees expecting a lot more from their employers, I think in, in today's world of work, this approach doesn't seem to cut it anymore. It's actually, it's not just us that, that thinks this way. And so I wanted to share this piece of research and it's a, a fascinating piece of academic research centered specifically around the importance of a personalized and engaging onboarding experience. And in short, it's, it's really an experiment. And it was an experiment run by these three professors out of the uh, London Business School. 
And it was an experiment that they performed with an organization called Wipro. Um, some of you will be familiar with Wipro. It's an enormous sort of business process outsourcing organization that hire tens and tens of thousands of people per year. Um, one of their largest operations is in India. They, they hire you know, thousands of people within call centers that, that work and support many of their clients. Um, and they, they recognize that they had a, a, a real issue with, uh, with onboarding. And what we, we mean by that, or, or I guess the reasons why they were kind of thinking about this is that um, they, they have no problem attracting. They hire tens of thousands of people, but of all of the folks they brought into call centers, they had a 50% attrition rate within the first six months, and they had really terrible customer satisfaction scores. So all of the calls that you know, are fielded by these call centers, um, the customer satisfaction scores were, were, were pretty negative. And so they wanted to try and correlate whether or not, you know, the fact that you know, they had no issue in attracting, but loads of issues when it came to you know, retention and productivity was down to onboarding. And so they drafted these three professors in to run a, a, a pretty interesting experiment. And that experiment took 1,000 new hires. So they took 1,000 new hires that, that were, were going to be joining Wipro, and they split them into three cohorts. Cohort number one went through the normal, traditional onboarding approach, the same thing that they'd always done, and they used that as a control group. The second group went through a second session, and it was a slightly different onboarding um, process or experience that was centered much more around the organization, so around Wipro. They spent time as part of the onboarding process focusing and reinforcing things like culture, values, mission, vision, and all of that stuff that had been used and leveraged during the recruitment process. They then took a third group, and that third group went through all of the previous things, the culture, the values, the mission, the vision, but they also spent significant time learning about those new hires as individuals. Most of them got time to spend with either senior leaders or managers who would, would spend time really kind of understanding what that person was like as an individual, whether they had family, how far their kind of commute into work was, and a, and a host of other really interesting kind of things. And what they were able to do was, in adopting these three very, very different approaches, they were able to follow those cohorts through their early weeks and months within role. And they were able to track, obviously, attrition, but also customer um, satisfaction. And, and the results were absolutely fascinating. So starting with staff turnover, the control group was 50%. We, we didn't expect that to change, and nor did they. The group that went through the organizational identity session, focusing on things like culture and values, that attrition had reduced by 16%. But the group that went through the personal identity session, again, really trying to understand those, those people as individuals, they saw a 57% reduction in attrition. It's a similar story with the customer satisfaction score. So all of the calls that were fielded were all rated and feedback was provided. And again, the control group, the same thing happened that had always happened. It was around a 60% satisfaction rate. The group that had spent time going through the organizational identity session, that had increased to 66%. But the third group that had gone through the personal identity session, that had increased up to 72%, which is really meaningful and impactful data. And, and what it ultimately means that we can summarize, and it, it's a, a huge piece of work that these professors put in, and, and I am kind of summarizing this very generally, but we aren't just looking for organizations that are going to be authentic about things like culture and values. More so today, we're looking for organizations that are going to be welcoming and accepting of us as individuals. And so for us at Emboarder, what that really means is experience-driven onboarding becomes the new way that business is onboard. Its goal really is around creating real human connections between important people like the new hire and manager and generating personalized journeys, engaging new hires right from the moment that they've signed their offer letter through to super important you know, days, weeks, months, like you know, month one enroll, end of probation, first year anniversary and beyond. It's something that is very much centered around the individual and it's designed to almost be an extension of the recruitment process in as much as being personalized, memorable, engaging and relevant. Um, recognizing that onboarding really is every organization's only chance to make a first impression, the companies that do it, or that have started to adopt this as a strategy, a strategy have, have seen or typically seen very seismic shifts in things like retention and productivity. A really quick question that you can ask yourself at your own organization, and I think this is an interesting one, is would my new hires talk about their onboarding experience to friends and family? The, the answer is kind of often no, but I think turning it into something that's more of an experience um, is a good kind of um, litmus test there. So with that, and, and hopefully have some kind of context around the why, um, we'll hand over to our two speakers. So um, Prabs and Flo, if you could both introduce yourself first, so the role that you do, plus a little bit about each of your organizations, that would be great. Uh, perhaps if you'd like to go first. 
Sure, thanks, Steve. So I'm Prabhs Kishor, and I am a learning specialist in the EMEA region for Dunhumbi. Um, and I'm also the global process owner for onboarding. So Dunhumbi, we're the world's first customer data science platform. Um, and what we do is we provide actual insights to our clients and we enable them to get the most value from their data. So we provide a number of solutions to our clients in the form of technology, software, consulting and media. And ultimately what we do is make them customer centric. Um, we have clients around the world. One of our biggest ones um, throughout the UK and Europe is Tesco. We also work with a lot of grocery retailers, um, the pharma sector and e-commerce. So that's um, pretty much what we do as a business. Awesome, thank you. And Flo? Yeah, hi, so I'm Flo, I'm a people partner here at Cloud NC. Uh, we're an automated manufacturing company. So um, our goal is to automate manufacturing processes, um, starting with CNC machines. CNC machines are machines that cut pieces of metal into metal parts, which we sell into automotive, um, aerospace and, and tech industries. Um, most things you come into contact with have been CNC'd at some point, including your iPhone, um, and the canisters that carbonate your beer for a Friday. So everything, is, it's, a, it's a pretty um, well distributed industry. So our software allows those machines to be automated um, and that's uh, something that currently takes a human one to 600 hours to do. Um, so we have a tech hub here in London and a manufacturing site out in Chelmsford, Essex, where we have a um, quarter of a million square feet and CNC machines running um, 24 hours, five days a week. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and my focus is on um, sort of HR journalism, uh, but I focus on kind of business processes like onboarding and engagement. Perfect. Okay, very interesting. Thank you both very much for that introduction. So um, different organizations in terms of size and in terms of uh, context, so hopefully there'll be some, some pretty kind of valuable learnings from, from perhaps and flow. So let's um, let's start then with with the challenge, um, and and perhaps perhaps if you answer first, and then Flo. So, what were the challenges around onboarding that you were facing, and, and why was it so important to you that you addressed them? So the main thing for us at Dunhumby, being a tech business and being quite global, um, we were going for a, a huge amount of growth, and although we were attracting a lot of talent, uh, for us the the challenge was to retain that talent. For example, in our India office. Um, where the market is quite fierce, we were finding that we had lots of ghost candidates, meaning that um, we had people as no-shows on their first day, and that was quite a big challenge for us. And because we were growing so quickly, we wanted to make sure that people felt a sense of belonging. And actually, for some people, the culture, um, the company wasn't maybe the right fit for them because they weren't really finding themselves embedded too well. Um, so as a, as a HR function, one of our KPIs is that we keep our attrition rate lower than 11.5%. Um, and at that time, when we were looking for some kind of um, onboarding experience, we were floating around the 12 to 13 percent space. So ultimately, we wanted to retain talent before they started in Tech Hub, so they didn't go to competitors. We wanted to bring that um, attrition below that 11.5 percent. And also at the time in our India Hub, you know, we had almost 33 to 50 percent in terms of new hires that didn't show up on their first day. So thinking about the money that we were spending on agencies and in-house recruitment to actually attract that talent and bring the, that talent in-house, um, I guess the cost of um, deploying something would be justified because actually, you know, if we could reduce the number of non-starters, then if that happens with us improving our onboarding, then it's a, it's a no-brainer. For sure. Wow. Okay. Like, really interesting statistics there. Um, and, and Flo, for you, what were, the, what were the main challenges and what would the impact have been had you not tried to solve them? Yeah, absolutely. So for us, it's kind of a, a very different way of looking at it. Uh, when I joined the Cloud NC back in January, we were only sort of 23, 24 people. So every hire that we bring into the business is, is a really critical skill gap that we, we don't currently have. Um, we're now up at 80 people. So we knew that we were going to be scaling pretty rapidly and bringing in people with skill sets that, that we didn't already have. Um, that means that those people need to be up and running and have an impact on the business as quickly as possible. And we knew that if we didn't onboard successfully, we would be waiting even longer for those skill sets to kind of come to full, full flow in, in the business. So uh, for us, it wasn't something that was going wrong, but more of kind of looking, for, looking ahead at a problem we could address before it really became a massive problem. Mm. So um, that's why we focused on, on looking at onboarding this year. Uh, it's ready for us to scale up and have um, something that was ready for us to, to hit that massive growth. Um, we also have very different, uh, two very different disciplines in the company. 
So it was going to be, how do we onboard two very different sets of people um, in two very different disciplines with, with two different uh, types of managers uh, into one company so everyone is aligned and everyone is kind of up and running as quickly as possible. Got it. And, and what were those, so what were the two uh, different um, teams or employee types? So yeah, we have, we have our tech up here in London, um, which yep. is, we're, we're hiring in the best people from Google and Facebook. Usually they've been through really cool onboarding processes before. Um, so we wanted to make sure that ours was even better and that those people were contributing, for example, to the code base as quickly as possible. When you look at manufacturing, um, that's a very archaic and historic industry where people are generally sold, hello, on your first day, off you go onto the shop floor and start making some stuff. Um, therefore, people don't really understand why they're doing things and they don't look to continuously improve um, uh, their role within the business and also improve what they're doing day to day. Um, we also see that it helps with being able to long-term retain people if they really feel like they're bought into the business from day one. Um, we're looking at longer retention rates uh, to keep people engaged in what we're doing. Um, so yes, that, that was kind of the two groups that, that we focus on. Got it. Really interesting that, so that research that I shared earlier on, you, you've actually both kind of articulated things that align with, you know, some of Wipro's challenges, slightly differently, but um, but I think that 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 is quite um, kind of interesting. And so uh, I guess that the, one of the questions, and this is one that, that we get a lot, and, and again, perhaps I'll ask you this first, how did you get buy-in from your senior leadership team? So in order for them to help you kind of drive this forward as an initiative, um, what what kind of things did you do in order to get the buy-in and support that you needed? I think for us is because we're such a global business, um, one of our goals is to automate as much as we can. So not really remove human interaction, but to enhance it. Um, mm. And onboarding generally was part of our overall like global transformation piece just to help our teams become a bit more self-reliant and in the HR space, you know, it, it is one of the things that we were um, looking at as part of our overall program. So we went with uh, Emboarder and more of an experience driven onboarding solution only because mainly because we we're in a process of growth. Um, and we wanted to make it a success to make sure that employees are engaged. So at the time we were looking at as a business, how do we, when we open up new markets, how do we get people on the ground to work with clients and how do we really um, reduce that time to money so we start to see revenue from those relationships that we're building with those clients. And we know that's going to happen if we increase um, engagement, which leads to an increase in performance. So we start to see that money from those clients a lot sooner um, and ultimately become more of a success. Um, so we wanted something that just onboards people quickly, it's consistent, whether you're in an office of five people or 900 people, um, because at the moment for us as a business, it's just not cost effective to fly people around to go to training and to feel part of the Dunhumby culture. Mm -hmm. One thing I did was to really map what are those global challenges and goals almost as a, as a business and how do we really link the onboarding, onboarding strategy to that? And, you know, I stood up in front of our exec team a number of times to really say things like, hey, do you know what, this is all about having an experience driven onboarding that's aligned with some of our other challenges, for example, um, reducing that time to revenue um, and some of our other corporate priorities around automation and also retaining talent. So it was really important to just really link the, the whole onboarding strategy to the overall um, company priorities. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, very cool. And and Flo, um, same same question to you. So what advice could you offer the audience who uh, you know in a similar position? Yeah, of course. So so for me actually getting buy-in from our C level was was pretty easy. Um they are a very kind of forward think, thinking group and using technology to automate stuff um, is was definitely an easy easy buy-in when I presented it. Um, for me, the bigger challenge has been that middle layer management. Um, we have, due to our class scaling this year, um, in a number of instances, we have a lot of people reporting into one manager. As an example, we have 27 people reporting into our, our operations manager in the factory. Um, that's quite typical in manufacturing. That person's actually had 300 direct reports before. Mm -hmm. So um, we we needed to make sure that those those people were actually going above and beyond the traditional onboarding um, and and getting them involved in that process. So you know when we're sending out pieces of information and we want feedback, um, asking someone to do that for twenty seven people is quite a lot. So um, for me, that the advice is sitting down and, and having those face to face conversations and actually getting those managers to empathise with the process that you're trying to put your new employees through. Um, Emboarder was great because 
I could set everyone up as a test and put them through as if they're an employee coming into the business. Um, yeah. Often those people were very uh, newly coming into the business themselves. So seeing that short um, short change in a short period of time since they've been there um, was really impressive to them. So that would be my advice is really get them to empathize with how those new joiners are feeling coming into your business and trying to get them to, to understand the, the, the improvements that you're making uh, being really impactful. Got it. Okay. That's really interesting. So so going back to kind of the, uh, the why, so perhaps for you it felt as though it was you were kind of reacting to an issue that you knew that you were having around attrition and no-shows. Um, and really aligning the objectives with company objectives with how you were able to kind of get by and so that's really interesting and and flow in i guess from you know sort of opposite end of that spectrum knowing that you wanted to get onboarding right from day one for the inevitable kind of um scale up again kind of helped you get by in from senior leadership and make them empathize so okay very cool thank you um so next, what we're going to do is actually spend some time looking at what Prabs and Flow have built using the Emboarder platform. Um, and before we do that, I'm aware that there'll be folks on the call today that have never seen it, don't necessarily understand kind of what it is or how it looks. So I'm going to spend just one minute really talking you through kind of what it is before handing back over to Prabs and Flow, who will talk you through what they've, what they've built. Um, so by, by definition, um, Enborder is a, a workflow tool that's used by HR to design and create beautiful, digital, engaging onboarding experiences. Um, those experiences can be anything from things like virtual reality office tours through to some of the more functional things like forms and content, CEO welcome videos, that kind of thing. Um, those experiences deliver over time sent via push notification. They're sent to the new hire and the manager using things like text message, email, Slack, or workplace by Facebook. And each message that that individual receives, be it a new hire or manager, contains a link. They click the link and border opens within their device's browser, delivering the content and delivering those digital experiences that HR have created. Um, there's no real limit to what you can or can't build into this. Um, I think, crucially, there are no apps to download. It doesn't require a software installation or a download. Um, for us, that means that our engagement rate stays super high, and it's frictionless in as much as it works on any device, as long as that device is connected, whether that be a phone, a tablet, a desktop, um, or more. So that's a, an overview, and actually, at the very end of this presentation, um, the audience will have an opportunity to text their name into a number, which I'll share shortly, and that will drop them into a, a kind of mock um, and border workflow, and that will show you exactly kind of what it looks and feels like as if you're a new hire and the manager. Um, so stand by for that. I'll share that sli slide shortly. Um, before we do, we'll, we'll jump into a, a, a deep dive, and so we'll look at both what, what Prabs has built and what Flow have built, um, and, and again, we'll, we'll start with, with Prabs. We're going to go into the back office of Enborder now, and so what you'll be seeing isn't something that the new hire sees, nor is it something that the manager sees. It's the bit that's really very much owned by HR. Um, rather than me kind of talk through this, um, perhaps it probably makes sense for you to, to I guess, talk us through what we're seeing here, um, and ultimately, uh, I guess, start with, you know, where, where, does, where does onboarding start for you? So for us, onboarding really starts once a candidate has accepted an offer. So once we've received all their mm -hmm. documents to prove that they have the right to work and whatnot. Um, and this can be anywhere from, you know, three to six to four weeks. So in some of our markets, um, people typically have a three month uh, notice period from their previous employer. So the way our one starts is anywhere from three to six months. Um, and then it goes all the way through to um, the first sort of three months within the business. I see. Okay, um, and and Flo, for you and, and, and at Cloud and when when does onboarding start for you? Yeah, very much similar. It's when that person accepts the offer and, and we receive that signed contract back. Um, typically for us, that's that's thirty days or less. Uh, as we scale manufacturing, notice periods are much shorter. We're looking at like a week to two weeks. Um, so we don't tend to use those long three month periods as, as much because it's much rarer for us for a smaller organisation. Um, and that, again, goes through to, to 90 days after the person starts in line with our, our end of probation periods. So it really is a, a three month onboarding process. Got it. OK, that makes sense. And, and perhaps looking at the that workflow that we just kind of scrolled through, we're now just jumping into a couple of examples as to what that looks like. And, and you know, these are some great things that you feel that I can see and imagine are super useful for your new hires. How many touch points does a typical onboarding journey have at Dunhumby? So for us, um, for pre-boarding, this is anything up to you before someone joins, is about five touch points. Um, the first of these could be three to six months out, and it's just a confirmation that they've accepted the offer, 
and we say to them um, about a month before you join, we'll start sending you some bite size info. We don't really want to be sending them something every other day because we've got to uh, appreciate their work in front of the organization potential may have taken some holiday. Um, what we'll do in that last four weeks before they join, uh, we send them a bit of information each week. So things like the story of our business, so they get to know us a bit better. We've got a welcome video from our CEO, which is about four weeks out. And as we get closer to that start date, we start to focus the content more about what it's like to work here. So they feel like they are part of the team already and that they've made the right decision. We talk about things like our values, um, our social impact, or how we give back to the community. Um, in terms of like processy things, we don't do too much of that on, on the whole process. We, we talk more about the business itself and helping people embed into the team. Um, we have looked out some of um, using some of the like the forms to fill out payroll um, and we've trialed some of those and they work really well. So before we go global, we like to test things just to make sure that they work, especially from a data privacy perspective. It's really important for us to get the legal piece right as well. Um, I mean, we just decided let's not get too hung up on the process piece. Um, let's really concentrate on the engagement. Perfect. That's absolutely speaking our language, less about process, more about experience. And I think, um, you know, certainly from from what we're looking at on, on the screen, it, it looks like um, what you've designed. Yeah, super engaging, very slick, very cool. Um, okay, and so, Flo, I guess I guess same same question for you, really. So we've jumped into one of your workflows now, um, and you've told us a little bit about when that starts, when that finishes, why that might be slightly different to Dunhumby. But could you talk us through a couple of the touch points that are important um, within your on onboarding journeys and why? Yeah, of course. So, so what we're looking at here is our Chelmsford onboarding process. Um, we have very different workflows for London versus um, uh, Chelmsford. Um, we have 10 touch points for employees, six of those before day one and four afterwards, one of them being on their first day, and I sort of welcome message. Um, I admit I stole an idea from Emboarder and I send them a Pharrell Williams video of happy to get everyone excited on their first day. Um, so uh, although we focus on uh, sending lots of video content of our CEO talking, um, sending information, we don't have a lot of content. We're a small startup. So for us, actually, a big impact is the process processes part. Uh, we're a small team. There's only three of us. And you know, this year, we've onboarded over 55 people. Uh, just between, well, two of us, we only hired someone else in the team very recently. So um, we do things like, uh, in terms of it, ask people about health and safety. So um, people will get a notification asking their shoe size and whether they have health and safety, if they have steel cap boots. Um, if that's a no, we can get those shoes ready for them uh, so that on day one, they are ready for them to go straight out on the shop floor and have a tour. Um, and our office management deal with that entirely, so I don't need to see the, the um, responses. We also use Emboarder for a lot of hardware choices. So um, we have very different requirements. I was looking at a uh, front-end developer, for example, that will need a uh, high-spec Mac and headphones and uh, God knows how many screens, um, versus someone going out onto the shop floor to work with our machines. So we use the logic function, which allows us to direct different forms to different team members. Um, so they can choose what equipment they want. And then on day one, again, thanks to our wonderful office managers, that's on the desk or in our canteen, ready for them to go straight out on the floor. Um, we also align a lot of our, of, uh, our um, forms that come after day one with the expectations that we put on our managers. So that is check, checking off whether they have had an introduction to how they we use OKRs as a business, um, whether they have had their health and safety floor walk, how their first day was, how the relationship with the manager is. And we can compare these to uh, the forms that are filled in by our, by our managers. Um, and we get really good feedback, um, especially on our, our pre-boarding stuff, um, especially from our factory. They really enjoy the kind of light touch uh, and interactive nature of it. Yeah. I noticed one of the questions there on the form that we were just scrolling through is, what are your thoughts on pineapple yeah. and pizza? How does <laughs> so that kind of... <laughs> yeah? Okay. Brilliant. I love it. Um, okay. And so... Look, I think it's pretty clear and jumping into just those, those two workflows there, both very different. I love this kind of similarities. And I love the fact that actually you approach this at fairly opposite ends of the spectrum. Knowing how hard you kind of worked on both of these and, and in fact, all of the other workflows that you've built too. Um, I think it's, you know, to what extent would you agree with the, the statement that this is about striving for progress rather than perfection? And maybe perhaps I'll, I'll ask you that question first. Absolutely. I think in terms of um, what your root thing here really is to think about 
and um, we want to engage people through an experience and not necessarily just introduce more processes using this so um I think for us, one of the things where we wanted to just make sure that everything in the background was aligned when it came to how we trigger workflows. Um, so we wanted to make sure that you know all of that was pretty good beforehand. So yeah, I guess the other thing really is just to make sure that you know we've got kind of small messages, um, not like uh, lots of deep rooted information around processes. Again, it you know, just takes away from that that whole experience. Mm. And 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 Flo, for you, in terms of iterating, uh, designing, taking feedback, and implementing that, like to what extent has that kind of formed the basis of your workflows today? Yeah, absolutely critical for us. Um, as a small team and in a startup, and I, I know lots of people will be able to empathise with this. You can't strive for perfection. Um, you need to work in an agile way. So for us, we use um, the term MVP a lot. So minimal viable product. Um, getting something out that is going to make your life easier, but also hit those targets of engaging people more in your process. Um, even a small thing is going to make a huge difference. You can come back and make it better. If you strive for perfection the first time around, it's going to take you a really long time to build this, and you're going to miss out on um, the impact it can have in the short term. So I review and, and change and edit and update our onboarder flows probably once a quarter. Um, and it's not even kind of set times, it'll be, um, I've had a piece of feedback that XYZ isn't working great, so I can pop in and, and change it and make it better. Um, one of my learnings is that I assumed initiatives would work well across both locations, and, and they don't. So it's been about adapting as we go along and getting feedback, um, and, and the more you do that, the more you'll have better um, impact with your onboarding process. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. And I guess a, a follow-on question to that is how have you learned to sort of personalise workflows based on the individuals that you're hiring? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, we really perhaps, to, perhaps go first then. Yeah, sorry. So we wanted to preempt some of the information that people would ultimately look for before joining a business. So, you know, we held some like small little focus groups of people who recently joined and asked them, you know, what kind of things would have really helped you before starting with us. So for example, we use a lot of logic. So we have one workflow um, and we built logic. So it helps us to not have to update so much content all the time. But for example, things like our Berlin office, um, kind of personalized content is things like what makes the Berlin office different compared to all the other offices because it has got its own unique little personality. Um, things like where do people hang out for coffee, what's good for lunch, what's the, the places where people eat, those kind of things. And the other thing that we wanted to do also is build in quite a lot of video content because we're quite hot on video content. I know that it works and it's the way people like to digest information, but we kept it quite short. So things like um, welcome videos from our exec team who can talk a little bit about their own business area, how they bring the strategy to life um, and more of a personalized welcome. Um, and the, the thing with the videos were in some of our countries, we don't have like state of the art video um, production pieces and whatnot. So we just created really simple guidelines for people. Um, most of it was filmed on mobile phones. Mobile phones are pretty good nowadays. And then I think one of the biggest things which helped from a from an engagement perspective as well with our exec team was we um, filmed our CEO saying a little welcome. So again, it was good to just have good conversations with him around you know the whole piece and how it how it brings engagement to life. So you know we don't have personalization everywhere, um, but for our main offices where we have quite a lot of football, where we have lots of people joining, um, and especially our centers of excellence where we have quite a, a large number of people, we've really looked to personalize that experience quite a lot. Nice. Um, and Flo, same question to you. Yeah, of course. Um, so, so we actually have different workflows for each location just because the nature of the work that's being done is so so different. Um, we use maps in there to show the location of our, our each of our offices. Um, we, we use the, there's a functionality where you can um, insert communication pieces so uh, new starters can reach out directly to the office manager that's in charge of their location to ask for um, additional equipment or uh, changes to their desk set up, for example. Um, I definitely don't use as much video content as crabs, but it's something definitely to aim for in the future um, when we have more content to push out. Um, but yeah, like I talked about earlier, the uh, the hardware personalization is, is a huge help for us. And, and imagery is a really simple thing to use, just photos of the location that your new staff are going to come and work into, making them, them different. So our, our Chelmsford Flow, for example, has lots of photographs of our factory and the machines on the factory and people working there. So it feels like they are going to join the, the environment they're actually coming to join. 
Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Love it. I, I think both both use cases and both examples there sound sound really brilliant. Um, a, a question that you know, another question that I'm sure that you'll you'll, you'll be asked and, and have been asked is is around hiring managers. So, you know, critical part of the onboarding experience and process. Something that Embora pays a lot of attention to. Uh, how did you engage hiring managers in this, and, and ultimately, what were the challenges that you faced? And sorry, perhaps if you'd like to go. So first, I think the biggest right. thing. So the biggest thing for us is how, how you frame those messages that come from Emboarder. So for us, we framed a lot of them as suggestions. And uh, when we were um, putting our comms pieces up for our manager population, it was to say these are really useful suggestions. And a lot of the things are things they already do, but the only difference being we now deliver them at the right time. Um, now, for pre-boarding, majority of the messages that came out were suggestions around how to make that person's first week really good. Um, so a little point is like, um, and I, my favorite one is that, you know, the 3 p.m. snack, this is what they've said, and it would it'd be really nice if you put it on the desk on the first day and, you know, you walk around the office, sometimes you do see, see a, a random Mars bar just sat on someone's desk, which is great. Um, but I think for most of these, in fact, all of them, we've always started with the why. So why is this a good thing from an onboarding perspective? For example, there's a message that a, a, a um, hiring manager gets about three weeks before their new start joins around um, selecting a buddy. So we talk about why, uh, the benefits of, and then you know they get to choose a buddy using the platform and then the buddy gets their own messaging, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, there's just, these things just work for us. Um, and I guess that's the, the main thing is always start with the why and, and really frame them as suggestions. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and and Flo, how did you how did you kind of cope with this, and what what were the challenges for you? Yeah, I I, I agree with Prabhs actually. That framing this as a benefit to the businesses is really really important. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, getting engagement from our hiring managers has been really hard actually. Um, we have a really high engagement from our new starters between 95 and 100 percent with every single module. Um, with our managers, that dips to sort of 60 percent. Um, so that means that 40% of the time they're not being completed. Um, okay. So training those managers um, on the importance. Um, we're still small enough that I can get everyone in a room together and have a really open conversations and explain in person why these things are important, the benefit that they will have to their business, and ultimately that's going to end up, if you're thinking about the business, is going to be the impact that person can have on your team as, as quickly as possible. Um, but it's really getting, like I said earlier, the... the the empathy with, with that process. Um, another tip and trick that I've used is to get EAs involved in it as well, because they can really help push um, those forms being completed, get managers to, to prioritize onboarding. Um, so getting your EAs on board is, is another top tip for me. Very cool, okay, love it. And, and a, a big question, uh, I guess then is, okay, so you know, you're, you're both at various stages of, of implementation and some key learnings have, have occurred, but how are you measuring success and what does that look like for you? And again, perhaps, um, perhaps if you could answer first, that would be great. So we always stick to our KPIs as a, as a business and for the HR function, it's around attrition. So we, we measure that level of attrition um, and that's our big thing. So we have a dashboard built within our HR function. Being a data business, we're really good at building things like that. And so it gives us good insight as to where we are in terms of attrition and we do it on a country basis. The other thing we do is we also use um, EMPS. So we send out a survey to a new joiner about three or four days before they join. Um, and we want to just measure how effective our recruitment process was. So, you know, did they get a follow up in time? What do they think of the interview process? Did they get the right information before um, coming in for an interview, for example? And we've set the bar quite high. We've said on a scale of zero to 10, you know, for us being world class, seven would be um, where we would sit. So we've set that and, you know, well, we're going to review that towards the end of our fiscal year and see where we're at. The other thing that we do is we also um, ask those new joiners, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend uh, Dunhumby as a place to work to friends or family? So again, that mm -hmm. um, is where we get that score of seven. From a hiring manager perspective, um, at the end of the three months, we ask them if the quality of the new hire um, exceeded or did, did it meet their expectation? Um, and again, we've set the bar there at seven. So at that three month mark, we ask both the hiring manager that question um, and then we also asked the new hire um, questions. And these questions are aligned to our engagement survey that we use. So we use Gallup as, a, as an engagement survey. 
um, and the questions are quite closely aligned to that. So when we report from a from a business perspective, we can see a clear difference when we think about those who've been here three months and those who've been here longer term as well. Nice. Okay. Very cool. Um, and and Flo, for you, how how are you measuring success mm -hmm. in cloud IT? We use lots of the same tactics as as Prabs. We we use that um, EMPS question: How likely are you to um, uh, recommend us as a place to work on a, on a scale of zero to ten? And we use yeah. that at multiple points throughout the process. Um, but I also use the onboarder data quite a lot. Um, we we use the uh, percentage uh, engagement reports to assess whether people are engaging with particular parts and if, if that's not happening um, and we can look at why and whether that's asking our management team um, why you're not filling this in is it because it's not worded very well is it because it's um, you're taking up too much time and we can work with them on that um, we also use um, okay. engagement tools, so we use PCON, um, and I segment data within PCON regularly to update our, our team, uh, our leadership team on um, how new joiners are scoring us in comparison to the rest of the business, um, so we can see if that onboarding process is going well, um, and then comparing that to our people with longer tenures uh, to see if that engagement is maintaining or dropping off. Okay, very interesting. Okay, that's really cool, and and so. Thank you both so much for, for sharing that. That's that's some, some really fascinating insights that, that you, you very kindly shared. I guess um, it would be great to hear from, from you each around your key do's and don'ts. So again, there'll be plenty of people on the call today who are maybe where you were a year ago and, and, and ultimately you know, exploring the kind of options here around redesigning onboarding. What would be the, the key and critical do's and don'ts that you, you'd both suggest? Um, I think I guess for us um, at Dunhumby was the, the amount of legwork that was involved before the actual building of any kind of workflows. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we really understood and defined our global HR processes being a global business. You know, it was different in all countries. Um, you know, there were multiple forms and multiple documents required from new joiners so it was really important to understand that and where we didn't have those HR processes defined to to really trigger end border we then had to just define that global standard um, from a like a, a HR team perspective you know we had lots of meetings in rooms lots of workshops we lots of poster notes we used lots of brown paper flip chart pens flying around just to make sure that you know we, we'd got it right that everything was in place before we launched it um, so the biggest challenge really is that collaboration piece. It really needs to happen, you know, amongst like if you're including your L&D team, like our talent acquisition team, uh, we had our operational HR guys involved. Um, so, yeah, quite a, a large part of the business was engaged. So I guess that's um, really important that you've got to engage um, the right stakeholders um, within the organization before you even start to build your workflows. Yeah, and I guess that ties back to your, your point around aligning this around the company's, you know, goals and objectives too. Um, mm -hmm. So, so Flo, what would your what would your advice and guidance be? Yeah, of course. Um, for us, it's it's slightly different because we've become such a much smaller organisation and much earlier in our in our development. Um, so for me, it would be simplicity and and using that um, MVP. Um, create something that's simple that you can get good data from, create something that will have an impact on your business and iterate and reiterate and make it better as you go down, um, if you're useful enough and agile enough to, to do that. Um, I'd also say that, um, similar to Prabhas, getting the buy-in from your managers, from the people that are engaged with this platform early will be the key to its, its success. Um, admittedly, this platform, was a one, when I brought this out, I was doing it on my own. Um, so it did take me a while, so uh, it probably took me six weeks to, um, to from signing the contract with Emborder to, to to build and, and roll out. Um, so that, that that's why for me the simplicity first was, was really important because of the, I don't have as much resources as a, as a global business. Um, and it just shows that, that both ways of looking at that can be successful. Yeah. It's interesting. You've, you've said you've um, said six weeks was your implementation time frame, and, and that felt like it was longer than it should have been. And, and so, I think more broadly speaking, around you know HR technology, six weeks is six weeks is super fast. So I think I think you know that's more of a congratulations actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so what's what's next um, for for both of you? I, I, you know, on this theme and idea that this is something that's iterative, it's agile, it's something that you develop over time. You know, what does phase two look like? 
So for us, um, we're still in the phase of a full global rollout, but the beauty is um, once we've got our standardized workflow, we can stand things up in countries within like a matter of days. Um, I guess the, the real big phase for us next is how we integrate it with our um, ATS. So we've already started working on that in the background. Uh, we just want to make sure that the data that comes out of our ATS is clean because again, you know, it involves a bit of human interaction there to make sure we've got those processes correct. Um, but one thing I would say is just don't let that hold you up. So, you know, we wanted to have an integrated system from the start, but actually we decided, no, let's work on that as a separate uh, work stream. I guess the other thing for us that we're going to start to look at next is what else can we use Emboarder for? So can we start to build workflows for um, offboarding um, people who are on parental leave and sabbaticals and so on just to keep them engaged? Because we know it works really well with um, onboarding. So, you know, there, there's, there's scope for us to use it for other things. And we're going to start to look at that in our next fiscal year. Brilliant. OK, sounds really interesting. Um, and, and Flo, same, uh, same for you, same question for you there. Um, so for me, it will be showing off our, our culture more in terms of visuals. Um, we have recently employed a brand designer to do a rebrand of the company. So um, I was seeing some fantastic uh, screenshots of Prabs' lovely uh, personalised text and, and great um, uh, colours and imagery. Uh, we need to do more of that. So it will be making that more kind of on-brand um, and using those new imageries and new logos and new, new kind of brand palette to, to, to mm -hmm. make it more engaging. Um, I haven't been able to do that as of yet because of the rebrand. Um, and for me, it will be using this to help manage probation periods. Um, many people don't like using probation periods and, and in tech it's maybe not used so much, but for us in manufacturing it's, it's really important. Um, so it will be how do we use Emboarder to kind of automate the management um, and the management team in giving us the right feedback in delivering the right information to our employees and, uh, and as an HR team collecting with the right data. So that's my, my next. Perfect. Step. Okay, sounds interesting. The, the final question, and, and this before we jump into the, the, the Q&A, um, and we'll, we'll whiz through this in, in sort of 30 seconds or so, but what would your three must-haves be? Um, so again, Prabs, uh, you first and, and then Flo. Uh, so the first one for me is definitely looking at engagement from a new hire. So definitely build in um, some kind of way to measure, you know, success and, and that engagement from new joiners throughout the workflow. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, and I've mentioned this before, is you know how you really label those messages to managers as being suggestions to do the right thing, as opposed to you know you must do this, you must do that. Mm -hmm. um, and probably the most important one when it comes to how you roll it out into your business is really look to get buy-in from senior people um, as soon as possible and have them cascade it to their teams, which has worked really well for us. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, for us, it was sort of understanding the requirements before before the, the design um, so that you're not kind of building something that's not going to have impact, as, as Prabhs talked about earlier, um, training your managers early to, to assist in getting buy-in. And for me as well, is keeping the data collection simple in the platform. Um, pick a... Um, a way of collecting data, whether that's uh, on a one to ten scale, whether that stars out of five or ten, um, it just allows you to make comparisons a, a lot easier and allows you to report a lot, a lot quicker and, and easier to your to your leadership. Great, I think that that's really you know sage advice. Thank you both so much for that. Um, you know, congratulations on both projects. It's clear to see the thought and the innovation that's that's gone into that. Um, we do have some time for some Q&A now. I believe that there are some questions that have uh, been accruing over the, the, the past 45 minutes or so. For those of you that are interested in, in experiencing a border for yourselves, if you have your mobile phones to hand, text your name to the number that you see on the screen now. That will drop you into a mock workflow that we've created, but it will give, give you a real first-hand sense as to exactly what this looks and feels like on your own device. Um, I think with that, um, again, many thanks to, to Prabs and Flo um, for, for your time and, and certainly for um, volunteering to talk today. Um, super valuable insight. Natasha, I think it's now back over to you to um, ask some questions. If Natasha's there, oh, potentially she's not, that's fine. If not, we'll ask some questions. So we, you, that we've got some questions sat here over on the, the right-hand side. Um, I'm going to do these probably in reverse order then. Um, so 
Jax Quinn has asked a question, which is the first year anniversary slash birthday sounds interesting. Often we only celebrate 10 plus tenure. Can you share some more info on how the first year engagement approach works? And I guess that's probably less of a question for, for Prabs and Flo, although feel free to answer it if you'd like. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer that. Well, um, one thing that we've done, in fact, the last piece of engagement that goes out to a hiring manager, new hire is congratulations. It's been a year since you've been at Dunhumby. Hope you've um, found your first year great, blah, blah, blah. But then the most important thing is what we say to the hiring manager, and that is, um, did you know that it's been a year since uh, your new start joined? Don't forget their favorite 3 p.m. snack was, wouldn't that be a great anniversary gift? Um, you know, it's purely optional, but it's just a nice little gesture um, from, from the hiring manager side. I love it. I think yeah, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, I think Natasha has joined again. Natasha, yeah, apologies. I'm having some technical go. issues. We've done, we've done pretty much a whole webinar without having one, but um, yeah, we might have a webinar without some form of technical <laughs> issues. So apologies for that. We got nearly there. Um, I think um, Flo, you answered Hannah's question. You cannot vote on these um, on these questions. Um, and you said that the time frame to implement was about six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, you mentioned that that was quite quick. Um, perhaps it would be good to get an idea of how long it took you. And then perhaps, Steve, from your side, actually, how long would you expect a, a full implementation to take? Sure. So the scary thing is it took us... Um, as a business to go for our legal and procurement process longer than it did to actually stand it up. Um, it took months and Steve, you remember uh, those conversations we had, but we just wanted to make sure it was the right thing for us to do. Um, we then spent literally, I think, a day and a half and within a day and a half our workflow was built. So it was that quick. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went away and built content and that whole piece took about four weeks to get the workflow stood up. And then after about, um, I'd say, a month of testing and just to make sure it was tweaked and right, we started a pilot in the UK as it's our biggest market. So, you know, you're looking between, for us, it was about eight weeks from us having it through to um, actually starting a, a pilot. Yeah, and I think I think that's that's probably um, the average. I'd say four four to eight weeks is, is usually what we see. Um, but that said, you know, we, we have had organisations that have gone live in a day. Um, so it really depends on things like the availability of content, how complicated your workflows are, how many you decide to build um, in the first kind of instance or iteration. Um, I think Flow's you know, uh, methodology around building one MVP, using that initially and then gathering all the data and feedback from that to inform how workflows two and three are built, for me, feels like the most sensible agile approach. Excellent, thank you. Um, and what about the formal background checking? Um, you know, it's important for a lot of companies. Um, how, how does that work um, with Onboarder as well? Yeah, so it, it's not something that we've built functionality in to do. Again, it, that forms more of the kind of traditional process than the experience. What we can do, though, is, is ultimately signpost. So whilst we don't have that as a mechanism, most there are plenty of organisations out there that, that do that brilliantly. Um, we suggest building within a certain kind of point of a workflow the right kind of signposting mechanism that will alert a hiring manager or HR or security who might have to run through that background check that now is the time to do that. Um, and that's the, the same can be said for you know other systems that you may have to use as part of hiring or onboarding or, or reference checking. And um, whilst we can we can kind of host them or signpost them, we'll never sort of replace them if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, and an interesting question, because I know onboarding from uh, sort of different levels within the business is, um, it, is uh, it can be tricky. Do you have the same uh, workflow or process when doing that sort of executive uh, onboarding? Or do you go for a totally different, don't use onboarder? How is it that you guys go about it? So, so for us, uh, yes, we do use the same workflows. We just have a different, a couple of different logic workflows um, that push leadership or senior hires into slightly different parts of the platform. We might give them a little bit more context around the senior leadership team um, than a super junior team member. And we got their forms for picking equipment, for example, a little bit more complicated. Um, we then tend to schedule. Our managers need to schedule meetings with people because we are still small enough to do that uh, with a lot of the team in the person's first few weeks um, so that it's a real personal experience. When we bring in a super senior person, a leader into the business, um, they're more focused on meeting other leaders in the company rather than um, staff members. But but yeah, we, we, we hope our flow through and order is good enough that any person in the business could, could get benefit from it. Absolutely. And perhaps from your side, is it a different process or? So for us, we keep the workflow standard. 
Um, however, what we've built in, especially for the hiring manager, is um, suggestions on how to create a, a personalized onboarding plan for like a foreseeable future, say three to six months, and some guidance on what that looks like. So, you know, who do you, who do you get um, your new job to network with? And the, those will be very different depending on the seniority of the person joining. Um, for us, we, we kept it quite standardized because actually there's a fair amount of content we use to tell the Dunhumby story because Although we're not a complex business, the the kind of things that we deal with are very complex. So for some people, you know, they might not grasp exactly what it is that we do immediately. So we mm -hmm. spend quite a lot of time just to build those foundations. And there's quite a lot of content around what that looks like. Um, but we are going to look into how do we start to onboard, um, you know, senior leaders into the business? How do we start to signpost some of the other learning programs that we have, like leadership programs and how they can get involved? So that's something we're uh, building in. Another thing that we've done is um, we recently just completed a graduate onboarding flow. So slightly different. Um, so little messages and they're like, good luck with your exams. Hope you've had a great summer. Um, here's some great things that you could do with your time other than playing video games, those kind of things. So we just try to personalize it wherever we can. Um, but yeah, those leadership roles, uh, when they come in, that, that's something we're looking to build in more. Okay, so it's more about the messaging. So the actual timeline and everything, the, um, who it goes out to, but it's more about the message um, for the different levels for you guys. Brilliant. And um, we've got one final question um, before we sort of run out of time. So um, Hannah um, has said that they have um, they don't have an official onboarding process. So like a lot of people, it's very manual. It's very email heavy, spreadsheets, I'm sure. Um, and they're sending out emails from new starters one week before um, they start and then an email on their first day. What would be your top tip to include in that email content? So for me, I, I do a little bit of digging. What are, the, what are the most common questions that you get on that person's first day or, or, or any employee's first day? Um, is it where are the loos? Is it do I need to bring my passport? Is it uh, how do I get to you? Is it do I have a computer set up? Um, and they're the things you should be tackling uh, before the per people join the, the business to kind of preempt those questions and give them the, the most information possible. It could also be um, how did the CEO start the business if, if your CEO is also the founder, in which case that might be the most important thing for you to address. Um, I think it's, it's definitely about asking, the, understanding the questions that are asked for your company rather than being the generalist there. Mm -hmm. Perhaps yeah, that's the same thing you me. Yeah, I would echo the exact same thing. Is just preempt those things that people would would ask and would want to know, and just have that ready for them um, a week out. Yeah, Steve, any insight from from the different clients that you see across the board? Uh, I mean, we we see some some amazing kind of things that that get done, but I think by and large, you know, going back to that piece of research, it. it the last thing that people want to see is something that feels generic. I think that the best way to generate any level of engagement, commitment, affinity to things like brand and culture is to, to personalize and try to learn about the new hire. So anything that you can do that kind of, you know, I guess um, helps to support that would, would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. Um, folks, that is all we have time for, I'm afraid. Um, that last hour seemed to, to whiz by. Um, if we haven't been able to answer your question, we will send it over to um, the onboarder team and also um, Flo and Travis as well, who, are, who hopefully will be able to answer them for you, unless it's a, a super tricky uh, question, which uh, might be a little bit trickier to do. Um, but we will pose those questions to these guys. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you didn't, uh, if you couldn't quite hear me or you were slightly late to join, um, we have recorded this session, so we will be sending out an email to you um, either this afternoon or first thing in the morning, um, along with um, Steve's uh, contact details, um, in case you did want to follow up with any specific questions to your business as well. So that is all we have time for, and thank you very much for joining us, and we hope to see you on the next one. Um, thank you very much to our speakers, thanks for the time, and um, I'm glad there was only a very minor technical issue. So thank you very much, everyone. Speak to you soon. Thanks. thanks.